This week on the CNET Tech Review, 4G is coming, just maybe not to you. Adobe Photoshop gets an update. The latest iMac upgrade is our editor's choice. And how to find the returns department at the iTunes Store. It's all coming up right now. Hey everyone, I'm Brian Tong and welcome to the CNET Tech Review. Mollywood is off this week, so that means I'm in charge of picking the hottest videos of the week and bringing you the good ones, the bad ones, and offering some sage bottom line advice because I am to be trusted. Let's kick things off with the good stuff. When we first saw the HTC Evo 4G, Kent German was drooling all over it at CTIA in Barcelona. This week, Bonnie Chow finally got a chance to put it through its paces. How did it hold up? It's in the good section for a reason. Take a look. Hey everyone, I'm Bonnie Chaw, Senior Editor at CNET.com, and I've got your first look at the much-anticipated HTC Evo 4G for Sprint. As many of you, you know, this is the first 4G smartphone available in the U.S., and that comes with a lot of pressure. Does it deliver all, in, all the hype? Well, let's take a look. As far as the design, the Evo is very similar to the HTC HD2. It's actually a bit bigger than the HD2, but HTC still manages to keep it uh, relatively thin, so it's still pretty manageable. Plus, you might be willing to overlook the large size when you get a glimpse of the massive display. It measures 4.3 inches diagonally and has a sharp WVGA resolution, so it's fantastic for viewing web pages, photos, and reading text. Uh, there's even a handy kickstand on the back that will let you prop the phone on a desk so you can watch videos or slideshows without having to hold the device in your hand. The Evo is also relatively easy to use and extremely customizable thanks to HTC Sense. Uh, Sense is HTC's custom skin for the Android platform and it's always been our favorite because it makes the OS look less techy and actually enhances a lot of the phone's core applications. Uh, for example, in the phone app, a tabbed menu along the bottom lets you easily filter through messages based on status, attachments, group, or meeting invite. Uh, and it also improves the standard Android media player by bringing in a nicer cover flow-like interface. Underneath Sense, the Evo is running Android 2.1, which is currently the most recent version of Android available. So you're getting some of the latest features like Google Maps with navigation, voice to text entry, and live wallpapers. But if you're an Android fan, you know that Android 2.2, also known as Froyo, is coming soon. I asked Sprint about whether they would provide an update to Froyo when available, and they said they're not announcing anything right now. But what we should focus on right now is the 4G capabilities of the Evo. The Evo is the first phone to take advantage of Sprint's WiMAX network, which claims to provide wireless speeds of up to 10 times faster than today's 3G. Average 3G download speeds come in around 600 kilobits per second to 1.4 megabits per second, while 4G averages around 3 megabits per second to 6 megabits per second. Sprint's 4G isn't available in New York yet, so I went down to Philadelphia where they do have it to put these claims to test, and the Evo did deliver. Um, I averaged around 3.42 megabits per second for download speeds and upload speeds of 0.93 megabits per second. So it was on the lower end of the spectrum, but I also did a 3G speed test to compare with 4G, and I was getting 0.77 megabits per second down and 0.35 megabits per second up, so definitely a huge difference. Uh, the Evo also comes with a number of features that can take advantage of 4G. Um, it's actually going to be the first to ship with a YouTube high quality player and also ships with a quick video chat and a front facing 1.3 megapixel camera so you can make video calls. Unfortunately, our review unit didn't come preloaded with the quick chat app, but we're hoping to check it out later. The Evo can also be used as a mobile hotspot and can connect up to eight devices. Uh, just be aware that this is going to cost you an additional $30 per month. Uh, the silver, silver lining there is that there's no data cap. Uh, there's a lot more to this phone, but the video would go on forever if I tried to cover it all. Overall, I'd say the Evo 4G is easily the best smartphone that Sprint has to offer and certainly one of the best Android phones on the market. Uh, it's packed with tons of features and it's powerful and it does deliver on the 4G promise. I'm just disappointed that they're launching it with so few 4G markets. Uh, currently, Sprint's WiMAX network is live in 32 cities and the carrier promises to bring that, up to, that total up to 44 cities by the end of the year, including New York, San Francisco, LA, Cincinnati, and Miami. Uh, I think the additional $10 for 4G is a fair price, uh, but it's unfair to me to make this add-on mandatory. And I know a lot of people have been unhappy about this. 
uh, in the grand scheme of things. Sprint's data plans are much less than its competitors and there is no data cap with a premium add-on. But still, if you live in a 3D only market, I can understand why you'd be unhappy about paying for something you're not actually getting. Hopefully Sprint can really start lighting up additional 4G markets quickly so people can get their money's worth and let the Evo 4G really live up to its full potential. The HTC Evo 4G will be available starting June 4th for $199.99 with a two-year contract. I'm Bonnie Chan. This has been your first look at the HTC Evo 4G. Now, I'm pretty attached to my iPhone, but as soon as 4G is up and running here in San Francisco, I'll be drooling as much as Ken. Now, some of you may know that I host a show here at CNET called The Apple Byte, where we break down everything that goes on in the world of Apple. Lately, most of the buzz has been centered around the iPad and the impending announcement of the new iPhone. But behind the scenes, Apple has been upgrading the processors in many of their laptops and desktops as well. Here's Rich Brown with his review of the big daddy of the iMac family. Hi, I'm Rich Brown, senior editor for CNET.com. Today we're going to take a look at Apple's highest end 27 inch iMac. So we say highest end, and that's because the base model for this unit starts at $19.99. Unlike the $16.99 version, this one comes with a Core i5 CPU that actually has four cores. That's the only four core uh, chip available in Apple's iMac line. Uh, this particular model, though, actually has a Core i7 CPU in it, which is a little bit faster than Core i5. Also costs a little bit more, so it's 200 bucks. That makes our review unit $21.99. So what you get for that price is the fastest all-in-one currently available, as well as the all-in-one with the largest screen. Uh, even Sony's highest end all-in-one only has a 24-inch monitor. So Apple remodeled its iMac line back in the fall, and there's a few different design elements here. If you're familiar with the 1699 iMac, nothing has changed. It's basically the same in the exterior. There's edge-to-edge -edge glass uh, going across the front of the system, and up at the top you get a webcam. Now the effect of the screen uh, with the glass and with the glossy coating is that it's very bright, appears very crisp, uh, the image is great for watching movies, for images, playing games now that you can get Steam on the iMac. The keyboard and mouse, both wireless, are now included with the iMac. Uh, you can see here it's sort of a trimmed down design. Uh, the familiar chiclet keyboard. You've got batteries that go in here and a uh, keyboard power button over here. For the mouse, this is Apple's new Magic Mouse. It's got a pretty unique design to it. We don't really love the uh, sort of sharp edges you get there. And uh, it's feels a little too tapered in the front. And though it has some gesture-based touch uh, sensitive features built into it, it's really not the most intuitive experience. So it's certainly a serviceable mouse, but we can't say we love it. On the side of the iMac here, you can see there's a slot-loading DVD drive. Apple still does not use uh, Blu-ray. And down here, finally, which is new to this generation of iMacs, is an SD card slot, which makes it easy to swap data between uh, mobile devices and your computer. Now on the back of the system, you can see that uh, it's pretty clean design. There's the same row of ports down here in the bottom edge. You get a couple audio outputs, as well as four USBs, Firewire 800 jack, a uh, mini display port jack, which we'll get to in a minute, as well as the Ethernet input. Uh, the system, of course, comes with wireless and uh, Bluetooth built in, so uh, in terms of networking, you're pretty much covered. So what's also unique to this new generation of iMacs is that the mini display port is bi-directional. That means you can not only send the signal out from the iMac, you can send signals into it. For example, you could take a MacBook Pro and connect it to the iMac to use this as a secondary monitor. That's obviously a very useful feature and extends the life of the iMac uh, once the computer parts are obsolete. Um, but we're a little bit frustrated by it because with other all-in-ones from Windows-based vendors, we've seen uh, HDMI ports built in that let you connect, say, a game console or a cable box. Unfortunately, at least out of the box, you can only connect other Macs to the iMac, so it's a little bit frustrating. Now, you can actually find on the market HDMI to uh, mini DisplayPort adapters that will let you connect game consoles or other devices. Uh, they're expensive, though. They cost about 150 bucks. Same goes with the wall mounting. Technically, you can pop the stand off, connect a uh, Visa-compatible wall mount to the back of the iMac, and mount it up wherever you want to. But most Windows-based all-in-ones have that functionality built in. So you certainly could take the iMac and its giant screen and transform it into sort of a Mac-based media center. Uh, you definitely have to want it. You have to be willing to spend a little bit more than what you get out of the box, and it's not really the most uh, convenient process. So we hope Apple is listening, and eventually they might take steps to make that a little more streamlined. Despite those limitations, the iMac is still one of the best all-in-ones you can buy. That's why it's an editor's choice, because it has a giant screen and the fastest performance in its category. So I'm Rich Brown. This is the 27-inch Core i7 iMac. 
You know, with that 27 inch screen and that super fast processor, that iMac could be great for one of my favorite hobbies, drawing in my abs and beach pictures. And luckily for me, a brand new version of Photoshop just came out too. Seth Rosenblatt is here with a tour of Photoshop CS5. Photoshop has been in the English lexicon as a term to edit images for a long, long time. But the latest version of Adobe's flagship program stretches the canvas of manipulation much farther than ever before. Hi, I'm Seth Rosenblatt for CNETDownload.com, and in this first look video, we're taking a quick peek at Adobe's major update to Photoshop. The look of the program has changed so little from Photoshop CS4 that users of that version should be instantly comfortable with this major update. But Photoshop Creative Suite 5, also known as Photoshop version 12, gives photographers, artists, designers, and lol cats obsessives with too much money on their hands a stunning array of new tools. Among the new features in Adobe's flagship image editing software are automatic lens correction, high dynamic range toning, automated editing tools, and significant improvements to creating 3D images. Let's look at the new automatic lens correction option which will fix an image that has been distorted by geometric distortion, chromatic aberration, or vignetting. Go to Filter, Lens Correction, and examine the tabs. As you can see, the panel is loaded with options and the process to fix this photo can be complex. You're pretty much required to read or watch a tutorial to get it right. If you need high-end image manipulation though, this and many of the other new features are killer must-haves. One of the new automated editing tools that's been getting rightfully a lot of attention is the Content Aware Fill option. It lets you remove an object from an image with a simple mouse stroke and replace it with pitch perfect approximations to match the surrounding light, color, and noise of the area. It can be used as part of the spot healing brush or with the selection tool. While the spot healing brush isn't new to CS5, the Content Aware function is and it makes spot healing much more accurate than before. An excellent improvement to the Photoshop workflow in CS5 is the introduction of the Mini Bridge. Mini Bridge creates a panel within Photoshop for directly accessing all of Bridge's features, but without the hassle of having to switch windows. It's a long overdue and logical improvement. Users who need Photoshop's 3D features will be impressed by the ones available in Photoshop CS5 Extended. This is a pricier version of the program that includes all the features of the standard Photoshop along with 3D editing tools. Part of Extended is Adobe Reposé, which allows users to convert 2D images to 3D and then edit the extrusion properties. Photoshop CS5 is nothing less than a boundary pushing leap forward for the Premiere Image Editor. At $199 for an upgrade, or $699 for a brand new version, and a multitude of lower priced and even free alternatives with varying degrees of less power, you really should think twice about whether you need this multifaceted, complex, but undeniably excellent program. With a first look at Photoshop CS5, I'm Seth Rosenblatt for Download.com. That content aware fill option is ridiculous and I can't wait to use it for cutting ex-girlfriends out of my vacation photos, and there are a lot of them. Not really. Now, in addition to the Apple Byte, I also host a show called Tap That App, where I sift through tons of apps for the iPhone and iPad. But did you know that there's a way to return apps? Well, neither did I until I shot this how-to video. There are times where some of us get a little app happy, I know you've been there, and we purchased the wrong app from Apple's App Store. I recently purchased the Iron Man 2 game, I know, don't judge me, but I accidentally purchased the iPhone version instead of the one for the iPad. I'm Brian Tong for CNET.com, and I'll show you a little trick that a lot of people don't know about, how to return apps that you've already purchased. Now before we jump into this, I want to emphasize that this is not intended to be used to buy an app, then return it, and hurt the developers because these guys are the people that are making our gadgets more enjoyable so let's respect that alright the first thing you have to do is purchase some apps from the App Store through your iPhone iPod touch iPad or computer or wherever now once you've done that jump into iTunes and in the top right hand corner find your username select account and log in let's go to your purchase history and then you'll see a list of dates and order numbers select the date that you made the purchase and you'll see an order breakdown 
then click on report a problem and an option will show up next to the price of each app. Find the boo-boo that you made, in this case it's going to be Iron Man 2 for me, that was $6.99, and click report a problem. A prompt will appear and you'll need to select the problem that you had and add any comments. I explained my Iron Man 2 issue and also told them how I purchased the iPad version immediately afterwards. Submit it and you'll receive a confirmation email. It only took about a day for an iTunes rep to get back to me, but I received an email telling me the charges would be reversed. Now that's customer service. There's really no reason to return a 99 cent app, and you do have up to 90 days to request a refund, but hopefully this feature helps you the same way it helped me out. I'm Brian Chong for CNET.com with your how-to for refunding apps, respect your developers, and use it wisely. Again, I want to stress that the point of this video is not to rip off the fine people who create these apps, because that would be bad. But if you have a legitimate problem with the purchase, like I did, it's good to know there's a way to fix it. Now on that note, it's time to take a break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Sock Monkeys Gone Bad. For your daily dose of tech news, check out CNET's Loaded. It's packed full of the latest tech news highlights that matter to you. Find out the latest gadgets or the coolest gizmos. All that and more Monday through Thursday at CNET.com slash Loaded. Welcome back guys, I'm Brian Tong and this is the CNET Tech Review. So far we've seen plenty of good stuff, but it's not all puppies and roses in the tech world, so let's move on to the bad. Last week, Molly explained how Tom Merritt has moved on to greener pastures, but we couldn't let him go without one more look at some of the worst programs to ever appear on Download.com. Take a look at this installment of the top five worst downloads for spring 2010. Welcome to CNET Top 5, home for wayward lists. I'm Tom Merritt. Spring, it's a time of renewal for everyone that is except Seth Rosenblatt. He's our intrepid CNET reviewer charged with digging into Download.com's vault every three months and dragging the worst examples of software into the light of day. And you all seem to love it. So let's count down the top five worst downloads. At number five, who is on my Wi-Fi? I'm, I'm not asking, that's the name of the program. Also known as what my Wi-Fi router already does. Now granted, this one is free, so I guess for those of you too lazy to pull up your router in a browser window, this could be good. Coming in at number four, you are celeb. Yes, you are. You know what makes you a celeb? Having money to burn on a program to make fake magazine covers. Yep, high roller who can just waste 15 bucks on a program that does what you can easily do in Microsoft Paint. Up to number three, MB Fashion Astrology. Okay, maybe you don't have the same problem Seth does with astrology or fashion. No matter what, you have to admit this is a pretty ugly program for something that's supposed to use sun signs to tell you how to look chic. Sliding into number two, Internet Explorer Toolbars. Seth has lumped a whole category together here, noting that Microsoft itself has put out a white paper confirming that toolbars have got to go. If you want browser stability, that is. If not, have at them. Before we get to number one, let's cleanse the worst download palette with a look at some good downloads. These are the top five most popular downloads on CNETsDownload.com right now. Ah, uh, how restful for the eyes. All right, let's get to our number one, the worst download of the spring, according to the man who knows, CNET's Seth Rosenblatt. At number one, it's Man Juice. Yes, I just said Man Juice. It's a seduction and dating simulation game with a textual RPG interface. Features include approaching girls, training pickup skills, and traveling to different cities. Man Juice makes iPad sound positively prosaic. Well, that's it for this edition of CNET Top 5. Don't forget to visit CNETsDownload.com for many, many good downloads. There's more good than bad out there, but now you know what to avoid. I'm Tom Merritt. See you next time. Man juice, huh? Yeah, uh, I'm not going to touch that at all. 
Anyways, look for a brand new batch of Top 5 Countdowns starring our very own Brian Cooley in the next few weeks, and stick around for more BC coming up later in the show. Continuing on with the theme of bad, back in October, Bonnie Chaw reviewed the Garmin Nuvi phone, the first smartphone from the GPS device maker, and let's just say she was less than impressed. In fact, that phone only received two out of a possible five stars on CNET's rating scale. Now the company is back with their new Garmin phone for T-Mobile. Let's find out if it's as bad as the first one. Hi, I'm Bonnie Chai, Senior Editor at CNET.com, and today I've got your first look at the Garmin phone for T-Mobile. This is the second smartphone from GPS maker Garmin, and even though I've only had the device for a few hours so far, I can already tell you that it's a huge improvement over the Garmin Nuvi phone, which was released on AT&T back in October 2009. For one thing, the Garmin phone has a sleeker design. Um, I don't know if you remember the Nuvi phone, but it was a bit of a brick and just looked really boring. But the Garmin phone is a bit sexier with a nice shiny finish on the front and has a slimmer profile, so it's easier to carry around as a phone and a handheld navigator. It also features a higher resolution screen, so everything looks sharper and colors pop a bit more. The built-in accelerometer is also much more responsive to switch the screen orientation when you rotate the phone. Uh, but more than anything else, I think what really makes the biggest difference here is that the Garmin phone is running Android. Uh, the original Nuvi phone was a Linux-based system, and although it had all the elements of a smartphone, the features weren't integrated well and the capabilities just seemed half-baked. Uh, but we know that Android is a proven OS and also brings such things as all the Google services, a better browser, Android Marketplace, uh, support for Amazon MP3 Store, and more. And as you can see, it's not running the standard Android skin. Uh, Garmin customized the user interface to prominently feature the navigation capabilities on the home screen, which I think is fine. I think the UI is pretty easy to use, and you can expand the tray from the right side and scroll through all your available apps, and you can drag and drop your most frequently used programs to this bar here, which you can easily access from the main screen. The one downside is that the Garmin phone is only running Android 1.6, but T-Mobile has said the device is capable of over-the-air updates and is working on providing an Android 2.1 update. Of course, as a Garmin device, you get a heap of navigation features. The smartphone comes with preloaded maps of North America and nearly 6 million points of interest. It can create routes for the car or in pedestrian mode and offers voice-guided directions. Uh, there's even an app called Garmin Voice Studio, where you can have a family member or a friend record a set of instructions and let that be the voice you hear when getting directions. Garmin's connected services are also available, which lets you search for nearby gas prices, restaurants, and movie times, uh, real-time traffic and weather data, and this time it's included in the price of the phone, which is $199.99 with a two-year contract. You don't have to pay an extra monthly subscription fee like the Nuvi phone required. Also included in the price of the phone is a car mount. The Garmin phone will be available from T-Mobile in June. We're definitely looking forward to taking it out for a test drive to see how it does on the road, but so far we've been pretty happy with what we've seen. I'm Bonnie Chan. This has been your first look at the Garmin phone from T-Mobile. In this case, it looks like the second time's a charm, and I just hope it's compatible with Android 2.2, which was also announced this week. Now the moment you've been waiting for, this week's bottom line. Usually Brian Cooley likes to work alone, but when he took the 2011 Kia Sorento out for a spin, he brought a little friend along for the ride. Poor little guy. You know the Kia Sorento. It's the car the sock monkey and his friends take to Vegas. But I'm guessing the inanimate set probably didn't check the tech very well. We'll take care of that now in the 2011 Sorento EX front wheel drive. Now you can bet nobody, either cloth or human, ever rolled like that in the previous Sorento. A dowdy dough ball of a thing that nobody noticed. But this second generation vehicle, which is hitting the U.S. now as a 2011, looks all right. Part of that is thanks to a design by Peter Schreier, best known for doing the TT while he was over at Audi. Now look around this Sorento. This is not the Kia Sorento you'd have seen before. It's not really what you think of in a Kia. The interior materials, the feel, the soft plastics, the 
fake metal, the leather seats, are significantly nicer than other cars in this price class, because Hyundai Kia knows they've got some image catching up to do, and they're working on it pretty hard, and I'd say rather successfully. Now, we've got the advanced head unit. This is an optional thing, part of a limited package, but it gives you, of course, navigation right off the bat. And I like this map. The screen's not that large, but the rendering, the graphics, the style of the information on it is, I think, very easy to digest with a quick glance. I understand how they're representing traffic. That makes sense. I know that red means traffic. There are some other systems that use red to mean road. That makes no sense to me. But while that nav system, which is good looking and operates well, is an optional piece, the audio sources are all standard and they're pretty darn good. First of all, you've got AM, FM radio, but no HD radio. Satellite, you've got Sirius for that choice. Now, under CD AUX, we have access to our USB or our AUX jack right next to it. Or with the Kia cable, it becomes an iPod connection. I don't have a Kia cable. It either didn't come with the car or somebody lost it. So here I am trying to use my iPod white USB cable. Nope, doesn't work. I tried to add an AUX cable with it. Nope, that didn't make it work either. Then I opened the manual. It says, don't do this because that may burn something up in the car. Whoops, pulled that right out. My point is this. I'm not crazy about systems that require you to have a special automaker USB iPod AUX cable to use your iPod or your iPod Touch. That's not a good thing to me because you're going to lose that cable and got to buy another one. And they're more expensive than the one you might get down at Radio Shack phone. This is a nice one. Look at this. I've got my BlackBerry paired and the A2DP stereo Bluetooth streaming. Again, standard with this car. And of course, if you got Bluetooth streaming, you definitely have Bluetooth hands-free for calling. All that bundled in, whether you get the upgraded head unit or not. That's a nice array of entertainment options. Now, I've got a rear view camera on that same screen as well, but that's not part of the navigation package. You've got to get another package to get that. It's in the premium package, which includes roof rails and leather seats. What's the connection? Don't do that, guys. Roll in the rear view camera with the upgraded head unit package. Don't make it part of upholstery. That doesn't connect except with my wallet, and I see right through it. Now, our Sorento EX is missing one option, an engine. Well, I guess that's an engine. Looks as though they forgot to put it in, though. There's enough room in there for another engine, and I kind of wish we had two because this is a gutless little thing. 2.4 liter inline four. 175 horsepower, 169 foot-pounds of torque, eh, it's not up to the job. Now the good thing about putting in an underachieving power plant is you can often get some overachieving MPG, and we do pretty well on that count. 2129 on this guy, front wheel drive, 2127 if you go for all wheel drive. I would trade a few MPG, just a few, to have a little more power. There's a V6 version of this car, drive it before you decide to buy one of these. One gearbox choice in our Sorento EX, a six-speed automatic with the usual shiftability. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference with this engine. Driving the Sorento with the four-cylinder is an exercise in thinking ahead about when you're going to need power because it doesn't have it when you need it. Doesn't matter what you do with the gearbox. I'm in drive, I'm in the Sportmatic mode, I've shifted it aggressively, and it just doesn't matter. It's a slow responding, slippery, out of breath powertrain. The ride quality is tight as a drum, no rattles, no squeaks, no float or flop. It's a nice independent suspension, but it's almost uh, too simply taut. It feels too much like you're riding on springs as opposed to a more sophisticated, compliant underpinning. So bottom line is you're not going to get that feeling of a budget Lexus RX on this vehicle the way you might think. But it's still a good value for the money. Okay, let's price this 2011 Kia Sorento EX front wheel drive. It's 25.6 base, that includes destination. Now to CNET this guy up, you start with the limited package for $2,000. That gets you the nav with traffic, the Infinity Audio upgrade, though the sources are the same as base, and these, do they really still think those are cool, chrome wheels. If you want to get the rear view camera, you got to go for the premium package, which also adds in leather and the roof rails. You're going to be annoyed by that right down to the last minute. And for the world's smallest third row seat, add 700 bucks. If you learn only one thing from the show, let it be this week's bottom line. Keep Cooley away from your children's toys. But it is nice to see that he's getting out there and meeting people or sock monkeys. Okay, that's our show for this week. Thanks again to Molly for letting me fill in while she's away. She'll be back next week with another roundup of CNET video. But until then, you can find more of the goodies kids go for at CNETTV.com. 
See you next time, and thanks for watching.